morning, hello, and how are you? I was looking to see if I'm still driving past my property, but I'm not. But I was in third gear by the time I got to the end of it, which is my definition of a sort of size of house you need to live in. Hello, got a bit of a rattle in the back. What have I got in the back? Oh my God, I've got an exercise bench in the back. This is my future son-in-law who's decided to get an exercise bench off the internet and then couldn't fit it in the boot of his car so he's put it in the boot of my car so I could drop it around. So, this is why I drive an old man's car, a Peugeot partner. It's, uh, it's like a van, you know, like a postman pass van. But it's very useful when you want to do things like uh, move stuff around, you know, it'll fit a chest of drawers in. Because it's wheelchair adapted, so it's had the bottom's been dropped and <clears throat> the seats fold forward and everything. Anyway, I've got no fuel. You might be treated to the sight of me running out of fuel today. Because uh, when I brought this car home, I decided to, I've got some diesel in the garage and I was going to fill it up. Because it's empty. But, uh, then my uh, Mrs. Angry went and ruined everything by breaking her leg. Hmm. White van, of course. So, I've had the use of two cars now, and the whole house, while she's busy supporting the NHS. Anyway. So what's up with you then? Well, go on. I've got a a nice clinical story. I've had some, you know, there, there, there's a thousand dentists have left the NHS, according to the Daily Mail. I don't know exactly how they've worked it out. I, whether it's a decrease in performer numbers or, uh, I suppose it must be because they won't have stayed off on, they, they'll have stayed on the register, so it's not a thousand dentists off the register. It's a thousand dentists who, who sort of, uh, I would imagine it's the NHS contracts. I think they've probably just given up their NHS contract. And this was last year. God knows what it's going to be like this year. So, <clears throat> LBC rang me up, Nick Ferrari. Oh, can you come on tomorrow morning at Sparrow Fart? Nick wants to talk to you about a thousand dentists leaving the NHS. What are the patients going to do? What are the patients going to do? And, uh, you know, to which my standard answer is that it's not, the dentists don't have any control over what the patients do. The government runs the system and takes all the national insurance. You need to get onto your MP and ask him what he's spending your national insurance on. And it's not, uh, this is the this is the part of the problem, right? So anyway, let's just get this in. Let's get my thoughts in order. Okay, get my thoughts in order. So what happens is about seven o'clock, I get a text saying, oh, "Derek, thank you so much, uh, but um, the uh, Russian incursion into the Donbas part of Ukraine is is taking priority, and we're going to be covering uh, potential." Uh, top level meeting between Putin and Biden and so we've scrubbed the dental bit you know section so I'm like okay which is you know I mean they do this to me all the time LBC they're always asking me to make myself available and then you know I'm lucky that I got a text because sometimes you're just waiting for them to ring you and they just don't ring and no one's bothered to tell you that they've organised reorganized it and that you're not gonna get on so what I want to do is just share with you the gist of what I think is the uh, is the thousand dentists leaving now I don't know whether to do it like back from the back forwards or the forward backwards but uh, what I'll do is I'll just do these things as I think of them, okay? 
So, <clears throat> what happens is, you had a very happy and healthy dental service when I qualified in 1981. And dentists at the time were, the, the, the level of their wages was pretty well situated at the top decile, which means that 10% of the country earned more than us, 90% of the country earned less than us. Now, you might say, well, that's bloody a uh, privileged position, you know, and obviously sounds a bit overpriced. But let me tell you why that was. It's because dentists have to have three skills. They have to have clinical skills. They have to have uh, uh, academic skills, you know. They have to have business skills because they were running a surgery. And they have to have manual skills because they were doing like brain surgery work. And it's very difficult to name another profession that requires all of those. Even brain surgeons don't require business brain. They've just got to have the manual dexterity. Uh, and the academics, they don't have to have the business. And then other people have the business. And the academics, you know, like uh, all these uh, startups in Oxford. But they don't have the, um, they don't need the manual skills. They get the little Chinese people to manufacture the stuff for them. So, that's where we were, and I think that that is where we should be. And when I went along to the review body, which I did more than two, three, four times, we always told them that they messed with this top decile earnings at their peril. Now, when the government decided that basically the dental budget was too high and savings could be made, which I think they did... I think they did on the grounds that uh, the same money went on fees and, and wages, if you see what I mean. So we had this uni unified fee scale where they paid us a certain amount and anything that we kept, anything that we saved, we took home as wages. And it was a very confusing uh, system for a lot of people. Uh, but it was a very good system because it encouraged dentists to be very efficient and to do a lot of work. And the whole thing balanced because at the end of the year the government just reset everything and anything that they overpaid they claimed from the dentist who'd underworked. And it worked brilliantly as it, as it was intended to and did from 1948 through to about 1992. But we always had this problem that we couldn't get people and the media in particular differentiate between money spent on uh, salaries and money spent on treatment. We looked at the whole thing uh, differently. We were happy with what we earned, but we weren't happy with what we were being paid to do the work. Which I know sounds odd, but I mean, <laughs> well, what that meant was that there was a squeeze, and obviously the squeeze on uh, the, the solution to spending less, as far as the government was concerned, was for the dentist to subsidise the service out of their wages. And we just didn't really appreciate that sort of approach, you know, not, not surprisingly. And when uh, it all blew up in 1990 and the profession went on strike for a short while, uh, we were constantly trying to explain to people that the dispute was not about... Uh, wages that we're not asking for more money and we quite we're happy we accept the dentists are well paid etc etc but that the government was putting a squeeze on fees and introducing charges for checkups and things which deterred deterred people from coming in and having work detected when it was uh, early and easy to fix so anyway we lost that argument we, we won the argument we lost the we lost the, we lost because the government you know we lost uh, let me say we we felt that we had the uh, the argument was on our side but we lost public opinion and the, there was a joke going round about this dentist who'd been shot but uh, he'd uh, survived because the bullet had hit his wallet and that was a you know a very funny joke and it just indicated that what the mood of the public was to dentists at the time they felt that you know the whole thing would be uh, could be solved if we would just um take a 50% cut in our pay or something and, and put some of our money towards uh, treating the patients and we felt that seeing as the government collects all the national, insur uh, national insurance that the government should be 
treating, you know, putting the money towards uh, treating the patients. So fast forward then a bit, and you've got the situation where the government thinks that uh, dentists are overpaid and uh, uh, they, they want to start trying to micromanage the service. So they start trying to micromanage the service and uh, deregulate a load of stuff, deregulate the corporates to try and get economies of scale in. They deregulate, they try and bring in uh, uh, foreign dentists, foreign trained dentists. They try and uh, encourage people who've taken, they put a stop on early retirement. They try and get people who retired to come back. They tried to get women who uh, were on maternity leave or hadn't come back after maternity leave to come back and uh, did all this all this stuff. Shall I... Uh, and that takes us... There's a petrol station coming up, so I'm going to have to stop and get some petrol. Have I got any money? Yes, I have. 149.5 for you historians. That's per litre. If you're watching in America, that's per litre, that's not per gallon. Oh, bollocks. I've got the wrong sign. That's because I'm used to having the other car. There we are, that's better. All right, so that's, that's the 1990s. I'll skip to 2004 in a minute. See you in a minute. Right, okay. <laughs> Peugeot partner, fill it up, 81 quid. Unbelievable. So, where were we? Interestingly, just very quickly, oh, let me just, uh, no, I'm not going to move it now because I'll, I'll have focused in on it now. So I don't want to move it. Make the editing, post-op, post-editing, what's it called, post-production, make it more difficult. So, uh, they've got a QR code on the pump and they say if you've got the SO app, you can just scan the QR code and pay using the SO app, which is, you know, it's good. It saves you having to go into the, what's it, but... Also, it means that they don't have to have a card reader on the pump because basically you've got a, a reader on your phone and so that does all the work. So that's quite good, but I mean, it just goes to show you how long technology takes to permeate through because we had QR codes in the GDP magazine 10 years ago. I mean, well, I'd heard that they were very big in Japan and they looked like to be very useful and they had quite a decent application in the magazine because you could... Um, you could have like a little uh, paragraph or a couple of paragraphs about a story and say, well, but if you um, if you want to go to the manufacturer's website or you want to go to uh, see some pictures, more pictures online, they could just scan a QR code and it would take them to a, our website and, to, and it could be to a page that's dedicated to that particular, you know, giving you a far more in-depth than you could do in the magazine or a uh, link into interactive content such as a video or something. Anyway, that's just an aside. But no, so finally they've decided. Finally, we're starting to see QR codes everywhere. But it's, it must have taken ten or fifteen years for people to sort of try and understand where they could use them and, and sort of get them into uh, into position. So 2004 comes along, and the government decides that uh, they're going to go full mental and nationalise the profession. And that's that's basically what happened although they didn't call it nationalization but until that point uh, you could you know when I qualified you could pretty much say where you're going to work and which patients you're going to see and um, uh, there was far far less uh, intrusive uh, micromanagement and um, you didn't need a you know you needed a contract number with a dental practice board but you didn't need a performer number or an NHS contract to get permission to see NHS patients and um, so that was you know so why have a thousand dentists left the profession well because we, we were nationalized 15 years ago we were sort of nationalized and, and what we're doing is we're seeing the uh, effects of that that's finally 
it's finally got to the point where Denson's saying no. And, and this reminds me of Ken Weech, our old parliamentary advisor to the GDPA, and uh, MP for Ipswich, a uh, hard left MP, and he said uh, uh, that the uh, government's attitude to NHS dentistry is a bit like a farmer who decided to save money by feeding his horse a bit less every day, which was a policy that worked brilliantly until the horse died. And I always remember that because that's so true, you know, it's so uh, apposite. And, and true to the, to the situation that NHS dentistry has been in for the last 30 years. And so finally the horse has died. Covid caused the horse to die. That's what finally dealt it the death blow. The horse died within 30 days of having Covid. But uh, the reason why it's relevant is because the government just cut back and cut back and cut back. And okay, they've announced uh, 50 million pounds to try and clear the backlog of patients who you know can't get in to see an NHS dentist. But the problem is that uh, when COVID came in, into this nationalised, micro-managed system, was injected this uh, requirement to uh, abide by a ridiculous set of rules, including leaving the surgery empty half the time. And um, and the, the the payment system where dentists were paid 100% of their money for doing no work other than prescribing antibiotics. Now the amount of work that they are required to do is being ratcheted up slowly, but it is very slowly. And so now I think we're at 80%, and we were at 65. I think it's gone up to 80, and it might go up to 100 from April. But. Um, this, I think, that it's all leads. I think this is an old way of thinking. In that, in the old days when uh, we had the fee scale and the expenses were fed into the fee scale. In other words, dentists' actual expenses were fed into the fee scale. So, for example, when we had BSE, they told us that we had to use uh, single-use endodontics. So, all our reamers and files that we'd been used to sterilising and reusing until they broke, practically. Uh, were we were told we had to throw them away and we were so like well where's the funding for this these are expensive instruments who's going to pay for them and they said well what happens is your expenses will go up at the end of the year those expenses will get fed into the formula and as a result the fees will go up you know which was let <laughs> it was sort of met with a, <laughs> a a guffaw a collective guffaw across the nation up and down the country from dentists who are like yeah that's right yeah that's definitely going to happen so, what they made dentists pinky swear that they would not take advantage of the lack of NHS by doing more work on private, or more, more specifically, telling their NHS patients that they can't have NHS at the moment, but they could have the work done privately, which is known within the profession as a private conversion. So, what they were, they were dead scared that um, that by being extremely generous and paying the NHS dentists their full pay, they would all they would then still do the work privately and effectively get paid twice. So, uh, or, or also, and also um, the other thing which was foreseeable, and which is why they made dentists pinky swear not to do more private work, is that dentists would have a two-year sandbox in effect to do a private conversion. Basically, they can do a private conversion. Here we go. What do you think you're doing? Can't just push in like that. Anyway, so uh, what's happened is the dentists have uh, had this luxury, this financial uh, landing pad, where they've they've had the. Uh, been paid on the NHS to do nothing while they did a private conversion. And that's the only way I think the final few will, will have done it, because there are people like me who jumped and fell and broke a leg and then got up and jumped again. And there are people who looked at the other side and said, yeah, it's a lot more inviting, we're going to do a private conversion. You know, the people who get help from DPAS and Denplan and whatever and, and do a private conversion. And um, 
and, and possibly keep a few NHS patients on, just the exempt ones, who don't care what's done. And uh, and then you've got the you've got the the other ones that are like uh, very very timid and you know a sort of bird in the hand type people who won't do won't won't try and go private because they think they can't or uh, it won't work and then all of a sudden they found out that they can and it will work <laughs> so so they're you know so now they're not interested in in their NHS contracts anymore. And also, I think on top of that, you've got this problem that a lot of them will have underperformed, even against the low standards that have been asked of them. You know, they when they finish the year and they're supposed to have done 80% of their contract value, because they've been doing it all privately, I think that they probably won't have that. So then they'll be crying and saying, oh no, you're asking us to do too much, mainly because they don't want to refund the money that they've had for not doing the work. So perhaps the Department of Health will come to some agreement with them. I wouldn't put it past the Department of Health to offer them an amnesty and saying, look, providing you you go back on the NHS, we, we will write off the overpayment. But, uh, and, then, and then finally, you've got the mainstream media, like Nick Ferrari, who don't understand the problem and then like devote two minutes to it and then cancel the two minutes. So you've got, you know, because for, for an issue that is not really going to affect anybody. Hello, this is my lot. Let me just get in here. You know, they've elbowed uh, an issue that's very, very important to a number of people on a daily basis for an issue that, you know, the, the invasion of the Donbass, which is, is, is you know, who, who the hell in the UK cares about that? Unless you're selling arms. Anyway, I've got to run. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.